Well, good morning, Happy New Year, and welcome to Community Groups here at Hickory Grove. It's so good to have you join us as we kick off a new year of ministry. Glad to have you join us online as we begin a three-week series using a book that I'd like to commend to you. This is a book by David Mathis entitled Habits of Grace, Enjoying Jesus Through the Spiritual Disciplines. This is probably the best book in my judgment out there on how to walk with the Lord personally. And what we want to do is encourage we as a church to commit anew this coming year to walking with Jesus every day, practicing what we call the spiritual disciplines. And we're going to spend the next three weeks here in our community groups emphasizing just that. We're going to kind of reduce a multitude of spiritual disciplines down to three main categories. This Lord's Day, today, we're going to emphasize perhaps the most important of the spiritual disciplines, reading God's Word. And we're going to do so based off this book. So again, I commend it to you. You can find it in our bookstore or online. It would be a helpful resource for you to complement, to supplement your community group lesson today. We're going to be kind of all over the Bible, so we're not going to plant in one text today, but I invite you to take out your Bible and why don't you pray with me? Let's ask God to help us. And then we're going to dive into this first key emphasis, reading, taking in God's word in 2022. Would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, I ask now that you would come and that you would minister to your people your word. I pray you would impress upon my heart and theirs the need to take your word in. Oh God, I pray you would make us men and women of the word this coming year. Shape our lives with this word of life, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I want you to just Take your Bible, place it in your hand, and just think with me for a moment. God has spoken, and he has spoken through this book. This is God's word to you. The God of the universe, he who created all things, the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover, he who was from the very beginning, God has spoken to you. And you have access to it in this very book. These are ancient words like Shakespeare or some of the old Greek tragedies. This is the word of the living God. Breathed out, the Bible says, Theonoustos, inspired by the Spirit of God. These words are from God himself to you. The Bible is an inestimable treasure. It is a most precious gift. God has spoken to you. He did so through 39 to 40 authors, human instruments the Lord used to compose this book. This book was written over a period of 1,500 years. It's composed of two testaments, an Old Testament, that is 39 books, and a New Testament, that is 27 books. Together, these 66 books compose the Bible. Some describe it as the canon or the list of God's revealed works to us. This book is inspired. It is inerrant. It is infallible. It is authoritative. It is sufficient. It's all you need for godliness and practice in this life. This book is God's revelation to you. Oh, just let that hit you anew this first year of 2020, this first day, Lord's Day, I should say, of 2022. This is God's word to you. And yet, just consider the tragedy that this priceless gift before me, I so often ignore. We so often don't believe it. Like, Adam and Eve of old, when that wily serpent, that crafty devil, Satan himself, questioned Adam and Eve. And in Genesis 3 said, did God really say? Since that day and time, we have been deceived into thinking that God's word ought not be trusted. We are like those in Romans 1 who suppress the truth. We know it to be true, but we push it away because we don't like it. We don't want it to be true. 
We are like those in the book of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 11 who grow dull of hearing. We just want to ignore it. We don't want the Bible to make demands on us. Only when it's encouraging do we want it, but when it starts making demands, we ignore it. We, we close our ears. We suppress it. We are all too often like those James describes, or I should say Paul describes in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3 when he says there are folks who don't want to endure sound doctrine. They just want their ears tickled. They just want to hear those things they want to hear. Oh, we are so prone to not believe this book. And so today, I want to implore you to see anew with me that God has spoken. And if you want to hear God speak to you this coming year, you need go nowhere else but this book. He speaks to you through it. If you want to hear God audibly speak, read it out loud. Because this is God's word to you. I pray that you would be convicted this coming year to have your life be shaped by the words of life. Oh, I pray that you would shape your life with these words of life. And I want to commend to you just a few ways the word of life can shape your life this coming year. Number one, if you're taking notes, mark this down with me. I want to encourage you to read for breadth, but study for depth. Okay, let's talk about those two ways to look at it. You ought to read for breadth in the Bible, and then you ought to study for depth. Okay, let's talk about breadth for a second. You you ought to know the Bible. You ought to be familiar with it. The Bible is not a string of pearls where you just like pull little bits out here and there and decide you want to read this little devotional verse. You ought to know the whole Bible. Now, this is not just me saying this. The Bible infers that all of God's people have been quite familiar with it. Just take, for example, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15, where Paul says, From childhood, Timothy, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, these writings that are able to make you wise unto salvation. Paul, in other words, assumed that his young protege, Timothy, knew the Bible, that he had been exposed to it. You too, as a member of this church, are constantly, faithfully exposed to God's word week in and week out through the pulpit ministry. Oh, I pray that you would supplement that by being a man or a woman of the word, that you would read the Bible for breadth. Let me give you a few ways you can make Bible reading a consistent, fruitful practice in your life, a way you can expose yourself to the whole counsel of God's Word. First off, I want to commend that you pray. Every time I read the Bible, which is practically every morning of the year, I open my Bible and the first thing I do is I pray the 119th Psalm and verse 18, which says, Open my eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. I pray that because I know the Bible is illuminated by the Spirit of God. That this is not like me reading a typical textbook. That this is a unique book wherein the Spirit of God speaks to his people through the word. And so I pray, oh God, would you open my eyes to behold wonderful things? I also remove distractions, and I want to commend to you, just remove all distractions you can. It might mean waking up earlier than the rest of your family, particularly your children. It it might mean that you do an audio Bible in the car one of the few times in the day you are alone. It might mean you find an isolated place in your house, and while your kids are napping or while some other things are going on, you just steal away so where you can have a distraction-free moment. I would also encourage you not to multitask. Go set the phone in another room. Go close the computer. Don't let other things distract you because if you try to multitask, something will get pushed aside. And I can assure you it will in all inevitability be this book right here. Don't multitask. And then I would also commend to you, would you schedule some time? I I would encourage you to, in the same way you schedule other things in your day, You ought to schedule time with God's Word. You've heard Ben Franklin say, a failure to plan is planning to fail. If you don't plan a time to meet with God, you are in essence planning not to do it because it's going to get pushed out. The tyranny of the urgent is going to make Bible reading keep getting placed down the priority list. Schedule it. And then lastly, I would commend to you 
following a reading plan. We actually publish one every year. This year as a church, we are going to read through the McChain reading plan. It's a plan that takes you through four different uh, chapters, different parts of the Bible every day. I, I commend it to you. Get a plan, whether it's that one or a whole host of plans you can find online, and that'll help you stay on track as you work your way through God's Word this year. You ought to read for breadth. But the trick is, you can read for breadth and then kind of just surfacey, not really understand what you're reading. You need to dig a little. I would make this illustration. There's a world of difference between raking for leaves and digging for diamonds. If you are just raking the surface, you're never going to get any depth. You're not going to get anywhere. You're just going to kind of clean the surface, glean the top. If you want to find some treasure buried underneath, you got to get out the shovel and start digging. And so I want to commend you to not just read for breath, but start studying for depth. Start digging. A few ways you can do that just in the most accessible sense is I would commend to you, get a good study Bible. The ones I recommend more than any other are the ESV Study Bible, the John MacArthur Study Bible in any translation, and I would commend to you the NIV Zondervan Study Bible. It's uh, edited, general editor is D.A. Carson. Go find that edition. Those three study Bibles, those would be my, my top three. I commend all three to you. I, I, I have heard that the CSB, Christian Standard Bible, Study Bible, is an excellent resource as well, but candidly, I haven't read through its study notes yet. I encourage those resources to you. That'll help you because as you read the Bible, it'll have a bunch of notes that'll help you kind of pick apart what you need to know to make sense of that particular book. If you are in particular interested in a given book, I commend a commentary to you. You can go find a multitude of commentaries in our bookstore or online. They'll help you really pick apart what you're reading. Perhaps the best resource for you, though, would be a New Testament or Old Testament overview. If you're curious on a book that'll help you get a grip on the whole Old Testament or the whole New Testament, you just email me, kylersmith at hgbc.org. Shoot me an email and I'd love to recommend a multitude of resources to you. Number one, I wanna encourage you to study for breadth, or uh, read for breadth and to study for depth. Let me give you a second point though, which is closely related. Number two, you need to warm yourself at the fire of meditation. Now, here's what I mean by that. Have you ever found that when you read the Bible, you come away cold? Meaning, you didn't get a lot out of it. You read it, you didn't quite understand what you were getting, and it just doesn't, it doesn't leave you feeling like you have communed with God. You, you feel like you've just done it. If that's you, I wanna commend to you uh, what Thomas Watson, a famed Puritan, once memorably said. He said, the reason we so often leave our Bibles cold is that we never warmed ourselves at the fire of meditation. Meditation. Meditation is something you need to make a practice in your walk with God. Now, when you hear the word meditation, it can kind of make you think, oh, what exactly is he telling me to do? Is this like that transcendental meditation where I just say, um, and do all these kind of crazy things and I'm trying to connect with the divine that way? That's not what meditation is. Biblically, meditation uh, refers to chewing on something over and over again. So for example, in Psalm 1, it teaches, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked or stands in the way of sinners or sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in God's word, and on this word, he meditates day and night. Now that word meditate is an onomatopoeia. That's a word that sounds like what it's doing. So the original word for meditation in the original language, that is a word that basically means to mutter, to kind of like say or mumble under your breath. It's like a cow chewing its cud. Just over and over again, you're rolling God's word around in your mind. And I want to encourage you to take God's word, find a part of it, and just chew on it. Just let it mull over in your mind. Psalm 111 and verse 2 says, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. 
study God's word by meditating on it. So for example, if you were to read John 3:16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. A way to meditate on that verse would be to say with a pen, get a pen out and start writing down some things and say, God, it's amazing that you are a loving God. As God, you don't need to love. You are just to do whatever you want. And yet the Bible says you love. And so I praise you that you are a loving God and that you loved us to such an extent that you made the ultimate sacrifice. You sent your son. Oh God, I'm just thinking about my own child and what a price that would be for me to give up my child for anything. I can't imagine it. And yet you, this great God, loved me so much that you sacrificed your very son for me. Oh, I praise you. Do you notice that is what's called meditation? I'm mulling over, I'm chewing on, I'm thinking deeply about that text. Oh, I pray that this coming year, as you read your Bible, you would not be settled with merely reading it. That you would ask this question, not did I read the Bible, ask did I meet the God of the Bible today? Oh, I pray that you would meet God through the means of meditation. Number two, warm yourself at the fire of meditation. Number three, if you're taking notes, mark this down, I wanna encourage you to bring the Bible home to your heart. Bring the Bible home to your heart. This is the spirit of James 1 and verse 22. Don't be hearers of the word only, but be a doer of the word. Now, how do you become a doer of the word? To what extent can the Bible influence and change the way we act? Well, this is a scripture you ought to commit to memory. 2 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 16 says, All scripture is breathed out by God, theonoustos, inspired by God, and it is useful for teaching, it's useful for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Complete, the text says. In other words, the Bible is not for your informational purposes only. We ought not be students of the word just to know more merely. Christianity is not an intellectual religion merely. It is a transformational faith. The Christian gospel changes everything about you. And one way you can participate in this great transformative work is when you are reading the Bible, when you're studying it, you're digging, when you are chewing on it, meditating it, you bring it home to your heart. Meaning, you meditate on it to such a degree that you start asking questions for God, what is this word demanding of me? Now, watch me. I did not say bring the Bible home to your hands. I didn't say bring it home to your head, but to your heart. Here's the difference. You can very easily make the Bible a how-to manual. You just bring it to your hands and it's like, okay, I'm gonna do this differently because this is what the Bible says. The danger with that way of reading the Bible is it can become very legalistic where you're just doing things so that God loves you. Okay, so then the other error is to bring the Bible home not to your hand, but to your head. I'm prone to this, where I just like to know things about God. It's very interesting. I love theology. I love to know. And so I just read the Bible to get more facts. I bring it home to my head. And you know how the Bible says, knowledge tends to puff. And before you know it, you can feel like you know God because you know a lot about him. But the truth is you don't actually know him because you haven't brought the Bible home to your heart. How do you bring the Bible home to your heart? I think one of the best ways is when you are reading the Bible, don't just stop with asking, what do I need to know about God in this text? That's a great question to ask, by the way. But don't stop there. Don't stop with, what needs to change in my life? That's a good question to ask. You should change some things, but I think a critical question you ought to always ask is this. What sin in my life is being exposed by the Bible today? Oh God, what do you have to say to my heart? What about my heart needs to change? An illustration would be, you could read the Bible and see a very clear 
command from God not to commit adultery found within it and say, God, I am going to be faithful to my wife. I am not going to do this particular thing. But if you do not bring the Bible home to your heart in this matter, and you just leave, leave it merely in your head or in your hands, you may not commit adultery physically. You may intellectually know it's wrong, but if it doesn't change your heart, you are going to continuously, unabatedly, unrepentantly lust in your heart. And Jesus says that in his economy, sin is not limited to mere actions, but it is often found in the inclinations of our heart. And so I pray that you'd bring the Bible home to your heart, that you would let the Bible speak to your sin every day and say, oh God, what sin are you uncovering within me? And make that a matter of prayer and repentance. Number three, I wanna encourage you to bring the Bible home to your heart. Number four, may I commend to you to memorize the mind of God. Memorization, man, that's that spiritual discipline that can send shivers down your spine, can it not? Because it's just flat tough. It's really tough to take the Bible and to hide it in your heart, as Psalm 119 and verse 11 says, to really hide it in your heart. Oh, that is not easy to do. Children do it in Awana, but the older you get, the harder it gets. How do you hide God's word in your heart? Well, let me first come into you, Colossians 3 and verse 16, which says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. How do you let the Bible dwell in you richly? Especially if you have a job, you have children, you can't spend hours a day in the Bible. How do you let the word dwell in you richly? Well, one way you can is by memorizing parts of it. I wanna encourage you to just diversify your picks. Go find like a verse like John 3:16 or maybe Ephesians 2 verses one through five and commit those to memory and say, oh God, I want to know you more and I am going to let these texts in the Romans road just roll around in my head. Oh God, I thank you that even while I was a still a sinner, you died for me. I praise you, oh God, that you are such a good God, that you have saved me from my sin. Romans 10 and verse uh, 13 says, if anybody calls upon you, he'll be saved. And so I'm just praising you, oh God, that if I call upon you, you'll save me. You can cry out, thank you, oh God, that you are such a loving God, that you sent your only son for me, that whoever believes in you would not perish, but have eternal life. You can, in other words, let the Bible just dwell in you richly throughout the day when you memorize it. If you want help on memorizing God's word, there are a multitude of resources. You could probably just Google it and find some or go to our church website where we have a number of resources that we commend to you as well. I wanna encourage you to memorize the mind of God as found in his revealed word. And may I conclude our time this Lord's day with one final reminder. You ought to resolve to be a lifelong learner. Meaning, the Christian faith, like it or not, is a faith built on reading and knowing God as revealed in his word. You need to commit this day to be a lifelong learner. That doesn't mean you have to be a brainiac, an intellect. You don't have to be somebody who's academic. You just need to be somebody who, if you're able to read, knows that this is a discipline worth developing. That to know God is to study God. You gotta study him. You gotta desire to learn him. So I wanna encourage you, you ought to be a student of God. You ought to be a student of his word. Theology ought not be a dirty word to you. It ought to be something you desire, you hunger for, you want, because you want to know God. Oh, I pray this coming year that the word of Christ would dwell in you and me richly. May we be found as men and women of the word. Would we practice together this foundational habit of grace? Would you join me as we pray? Father, do this, I pray, for the sake of Jesus and the good of this church I love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.